Hi, this is lecture 16, History 1302. Uh, I'm your professor, Professor Clayton K. Hanlust. Uh, we're going to be talking about the civil rights movement in today's lecture. Uh, and the civil rights movement is, a, is an era uh, that has a number of different uh, starts. It has a number of different people involved in it. Uh, it's got uh, a very odd sort of way of saying that, you know, this is the beginning. There's no a uh, real clear way to say that. So uh, understand that when I say that the beginning here uh, of the civil rights movement is World War II, uh, understand that most historians realize that that's a sort of artificial beginning. But World War II uh, is an important uh, moment in quote unquote creating the civil rights movement. As we mentioned, when we talked about World War II to begin with, there was uh, the obvious rhetoric of anti-racism that pervaded American uh, propaganda during that period. We talked about uh, the wartime necessities uh, of things like the Battle of the Bulge, where uh, manpower shortages were so dramatic that commanders in the field didn't care what color the soldiers were, even if they had, quote, not had combat experience to that point. Uh, those commanders were saying, bring them to the front. We don't care what color these people were. And I think a very important part of all of that stuff, and especially as it relates to World War II, is Harry Truman. And Harry Truman is a very uh, interesting character uh, in terms of the civil rights movement because he is a person who is full of contradiction in terms of, uh, of a civil rights president, if you will. Uh, I've got a quote from uh, Truman up here that I've kind of uh, redacted the word. I think you all know what the word is there. Uh, that's on the quote, but I want you to read that quote, but I want you to think about a few things uh, as I mention that stuff, That uh, as you read that quote. Uh, Harry Truman's parents and grandparents uh, were from Missouri. He was from Missouri himself, which was a very heavily segregated state during his lifetime. His grandparents were slaveholders and very, very solidly supported the Confederacy during uh, during the Civil War. Uh, his mother suffered, as she put it, quote, outrages at the hands of the Union troops, and she decried the Union side during the Civil War, uh, as far as, and, uh, as well as Abraham Lincoln, uh, right up until her dying days. Uh, nonetheless, all of this stuff, that quote together, Harry Truman somehow became the president that would do more for civil rights in this country than any other president since Abraham Lincoln uh, had gotten Congress to pass the 13th through the 15th Amendments. And understand, uh, you know, Lincoln was dead when the 14th and 15th Amendments were passed, but those were things that he supported. So he still gets credit for those things. But I want you to listen to some of this stuff. Uh, this was Harry Truman's State of the Union address from January of 1947. Just listen to this part. Quote, we have recently witnessed in this country numerous attacks upon the constitutional rights of individual citizens as a result of racial and religious bigotry. Substantial segments of our people have been prevented from exercising fully their rights to participate in the election of public officials, both locally and nationally. Freedom to engage in lawful callings has been denied. The fight, the will to fight these crimes should be in the hearts of every one of us. For the federal government, that fight is now being carried on by the Department of Justice to the full extent of the powers that have been conferred upon it. While the Constitution withholds from the federal government the major task of preserving peace in the several states, I am not convinced that the present legislation reached the, has reached the limits of federal power to protect the civil rights of its citizens. I have, therefore, by executive order, established the President's Committee on Civil Rights to study and report on the whole problem of federally secured rights, civil rights, excuse me, with a view to making recommendations to Congress. So in the State of U the Union address, Harry Truman basically says, this presidency is going to be about expansion of civil rights and expansion of the federal government's role in civil rights. Now, Harry Truman also made a very important distinction there. He said, for the most part, it's not up to the federal government to come in and tell states how to do things, but there is more that the federal government can be doing. Okay. Now, that statement alone is a remarkable statement for a president of this era. That's more than virtually any other president had been willing to say 
up to that point, and that includes his predecessor, Franklin D. Roosevelt. So as a consequence of that State of the Union address, Harry Truman issued what was known as Executive Order 9098 that created specifically that uh, President's Committee on Civil Rights. Now, he also uh, established Executive Order 9981. Now, Executive Order 9981 was, was done essentially in his capacity as commander in chief of the United States military forces. Executive Order 9981 uh, called for or ordered the desegregation of the military. So essentially it codified what had already been going on in the United States military since things like the Battle of the Bulge and the Pacific Theater uh, in World War II. But Executive Order 9981 also created the Committee on Equal Treatment uh, in the military. It authorized Congress to examine rules and recommend changes uh, to the military that would benefit civil rights and bring about equal treatment of all within, uh, within the military. And then he also ordered federal agencies to cooperate with this committee. One of the things that Truman's advisors told him uh, that they reported back to him, uh, both in the lead up to Executive Order 9981 and in the aftermath of establishing Executive 9098, federal uh, agencies were simply refusing to hand over information. They wouldn't turn over uh, data. They wouldn't turn over uh, any sort of, uh, of information on, uh, on populations, on percentages of people who worked, uh, how, how many people got promoted, uh, that sort of stuff. So Truman is literally having to order federal agencies to cooperate with this committee because there's just they're just flat out refusing to do it. Now, in addition to this, Harry Truman also established a 10 point plan was known as Truman's 10 point plan uh, aimed at addressing civil rights. Now, it's a pretty big list. I'm not going to put on an exam, you know, name Harry Truman's 10 points. Uh, in the Truman 10 point plan. But I do think this is worth looking at because Harry Truman is coming out and saying, these are the things that I support. And I, I'm not, I'm going to probably beat this until, uh, uh, until it's, you know, until you feel overwrought with it. But this is more, what Truman is doing here is more than any other president had done since Abraham Lincoln. This is a remarkable statement about what Harry Truman was doing here. The Truman 10-point plan established a permanent commission on civil rights and a civil rights division within the Justice Department. So the stuff that had begun during World War II, for example, uh, with the uh, Fair Employment Practices Commission, that gets expanded in the 10-point plan. Uh, Truman also called for the strengthening of existing civil rights statutes. He called for a federal anti-lynching law. Now think about this, think about the, since we're coming to the end here, think about what, what importance this has. At the beginning of our class, we have advocates who are begging the president to sign civil rights legislation. Here, by 1947, we've got a president who is saying to Congress, pass the legislation, I will sign it. Up until that point, all of these presidents were refusing to even discuss the idea. Here, Truman is saying, write the law, I will sign it. So he's calling on Congress to create a federal anti-lynching law. He called for more adequate protections of the right to vote to make sure that everybody can actually cast a ballot in this country. Speaking of that Fair Employment Practices Commission from World War II, Truman makes it a permanent division of the Justice Department. He also stated, point, uh, said flat out, there will be no more discrimination in interstate transportation. Now think about again, think about how these things would work. If a company operated a bus line, for example, uh, in Texas that went from Houston to Austin to Dallas and back to Houston, that is not interstate transportation. So that would be under the direction, the under the authority, excuse me, of the Texas Department of Transportation. Nothing, if Texas decided, you know, they were going to segregate 
There'd be nothing that could be done about it. But what Truman is talking about is in interstate transportation, since that is under the purview of the federal government, the federal government can ban discrimination in that. So the difference would be a bus line that goes from, say, Houston to Austin to Dallas to Little Rock, Arkansas, and then back to Houston. I know that's a really, that would be a crazy route. But if that were the route, then the federal government would have jurisdiction over that because it's interstate. Okay, it's crossing two different state boundaries. Truman also called for home rule and presidential suffrage for the District of Columbia. Think about what that means in 1947. In, in 1947, if you lived in the nation's capital, you were prohibited from voting for president in this country, which seems completely insane to live in the, in the state's capital or the nation's capital and be unable to vote for president. Truman called for statehood for Hawaii and Alaska. And as far as the rest of the, the United States' possessions, uh, such as Guam, such as the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Puerto Rico, he called for self-government of those areas. He also called for equal opportunity in naturalization and citizenship, essentially a rollback of things like the, uh, the Immigration Act of 19. 24 and the laws associated with that. And he also called for a settlement of claims by the Japanese American internees, the people who were in the internment camps. Now, these recommendations, these are recommendations by Truman. This is not something that Truman is saying, I'm signing an executive order and all of this is done. This is going to take a long time. Truman is not even remotely close to the presidency by the time most of this stuff gets done. It also winds up getting watered down uh, dramatically. For example, uh, since Truman had specifically said that the national government doesn't have a role in uh, providing peace for the individual states, Southern senators and, re and representatives argued successfully for the bulk of the 1950s that states' rights prohibited the national government from coming in and doing anything about voting legislation or, uh, or any sort of civil rights protection uh, in the individual states. The District of Columbia, uh, the nation's capital, would not vote for presidents until 1964. The United States Congress proposed, got passed, ultimately got ratified an amendment that did grant the District of Columbia voting rights, but they don't get it done until 1961. So the first presidential election affected is 1964. Now, the issue of interstate travel is going to be used. The role of the federal government in protecting interstate transportation, it will wind up being used, but not until the Kennedy administration in the 1960s. Uh, as far as uh, civil rights, uh, excuse me, an anti-lynching law, that doesn't happen until much, much later. Uh, but Truman does actually deserve credit for kickstarting this moment. It makes, uh, it, it's a remarkable moment that uh, Truman has engaged in here. Now, all of this stuff together, it's hard for us to imagine in the 2020s. It's hard for us to imagine what the places like the South were like uh, in the 1950s. It was a much different era uh, when this civil rights struggle occurred. It's hard for us to imagine a place where people who simply tried to register to vote or people who tried to help them register to vote might get killed. The struggle for civil rights was a difficult one, and it ultimately would turn violent in many circumstances. Uh, and it's worth pointing out here in 2022, as these lectures are being recorded, that this is not a struggle that has ended. It's still ongoing. So we've, there's a lot of work to be done with civil rights. Now, what is often referred to as the civil rights movement was simply not going to happen without the involvement of Americans, particularly African Americans. Harry Truman could have this huge change of heart. And I'm not going to speculate on what the change of heart was. You all read the quote, and then you've all heard what Truman did. So somewhere along the line, Truman had some sort of a change of heart. But Truman could not simply legislate or order that the country can uh, confirm his new ideas. Okay, Something else was going to have to happen. People were going to have to become directly involved in all of this. Uh, and this is where the people come in, 
uh, the first phase of civil rights in this country or the civil rights movement is going to be a judicial phase. And this is just, uh, it's, I want to point out this uh, fairly clearly. Right now, we're only talking about civil rights for African Americans. There are multiple civil rights movements, as we're going to see. There are civil rights movements for African Americans, for Latinos. There's a brown power movement. There's a red power movement for Native Americans. There is obviously a feminist movement, a women's rights movement. As you were asked to read in your reader, there is a gay rights movement in this country. There are all sorts of things that are kind of happening in this one period of time where people are challenging the status quo and demanding rights for everybody. Okay, But right now, we're focused on the African-American part of civil rights, and that's where this judicial phase is going to be kicking things off. Now, the key figure in this judicial phase is a man named Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, many of you probably have heard of him. He wound up becoming a uh, justice on the Supreme Court. Uh, but before that, he had a very prominent legal career. Uh, he'd grown up in Baltimore, a city where virtually every profession was closed to African Americans because of Jim Crow laws. Marshall had graduated from Howard University's law school and became lead counsel for the NAACP. And he was really important from that standpoint in that he wanted segregation to go. He obviously knew that segregation, the legalization of segregation, had to go. But he also was convinced early on in his career that a full assault, a direct assault on Plessy versus Ferguson, which had instituted all of this, that was not possible right now, not with this court and not with the current precedents before the Supreme Court. There was no way that that Supreme Court would conclude that we need to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. So what his idea, what Thurgood Marshall's idea, and Marshall, for those of you who are wondering, uh, in this photograph, he's the guy on the far right. Thurgood Marshall's idea was to chip away at the legal foundations of segregation. The idea, think of it like a tree. If a big tree is there, you can't just knock it down all at once. I mean, it's Theoretically, you could, but it's going to be much easier to break it down bit by bit by bit by bit, and then pretty soon it'll just come down on its own. So what Marshall's idea here is, is chip away at the legal foundations of segregation, and then it'll just fall on its own. Now, Marshall's going to go on to argue 20 or 32 cases before the Supreme Court, and he's going to win 29 of them, which is a pretty remarkable winning record, winning uh, percentage in front of the Supreme Court. Over the course of these cases that he argues, he got the courts to declare uh, itself for equal pay for black teachers, that it was unconstitutional to pay black teachers less than it paid white teachers. It got the Supreme, he got the Supreme Court to require that states allow African Americans to serve on juries. The very idea that blacks were pro prohibited from serving on juries was a civil rights bit of discrimination. So a little matter of equality is settled right there. Blacks served on juries. Marshall got the Supreme Court to rule against what are called restrictive covenants, agreements that uh, neighborhoods would put into place to ban residents from selling to African-Americans and to other ethnic and racial minorities. And then in 1935, he got a very important personal case victory. In 1935, he got the Supreme Court to rule that the University of Maryland must admit African-American students. Now, the reason this was so personal to him was Marshall had actually applied to the University of Maryland's law school after graduating from his from undergraduate, uh, and he was rejected on the basis of race. So in 1935, the University of Maryland was forced to admit African American students. Now, this phase that Marshall is in instituting here is, is, as I called it, the judicial phase. It's using the courts to get rid of all of this discrimination. Okay, it's not going out marching in the streets. It's not going out protesting directly or engaging in sit-ins. It's using the legal system to do the work. Now, 
in addition to all of these cases, Marshall wound up arguing or being a part of a very important Supreme Court case that was the first step in getting Plessy versus Ferguson overturned. And that case was Sweat v. Painter. Sweat v. Painter. Sweat v. Painter centered around a young man named Marion Sweat. He's pictured in the very center of the photograph that you see on your screen. He's the one wearing the tie with the jacket folded over his, uh, over his arm. Marion Sweat had applied to the University of Texas's law school in 1947 and had been denied admission. Sweat sued the state, arguing that the Texas Constitution required that the state at minimum provide, quote, a separate school for white and colored children. Now, this are the attorneys argued in this case that it extended to public colleges and universities, that if the state is undertaking to do this, then they at minimum have to have equal facilities for black and white students. There simply did not exist a black law school. So Marion Sweat should be allowed to apply to the University of Texas's law school. Now, the Texas Board of Education, the Texas Secretary of Education, the governor's administration all got together and they created something called the School of Law for the Texas Southern University for Negroes. The School of Law, as the with this other long bit of title to it, this wound up being created on the second floor of a private home in Austin University. There is no way that that could have been considered a quote unquote equal school or an equal facility. Okay, remember the law is separate but equal. It's certainly separate, but there is no way possible it could be equal. Once Texas created this school of law for Texas Southern University, the state looked at this and said, we're done, we've finished, we've met the burden. Sweat, however, his lawyers, one of whom was Thurgood Marshall, they sought a review, they sought and were granted a review by the Supreme Court uh, called a sorcerari case. And in this case, in this type of case, the appellate court looks at the lower court's ruling and orders the lower court to review their decision. Now, this is all grossly oversimplified, but what happens in this type of case when, a, when a, an appellate court like the Supreme Court issues an a sorcerari brief, what they're doing is they're telling the lower court, you need to figure out exactly why you ruled this way, why you ruled whatever, in this case, that the burden had been met for separate but equal. And the reason they're doing that is because it's essentially a warning that on appeal, you are likely to get overturned. Nobody wants to get overturned. So this is a essentially a warning to the courts in Texas that you're going to get overturned here. Now, because of this, because this wound up happening, because the sorcerari brief happened, the state courts ordered that Marion Sweat be allowed to attend the University of Texas Law School in 1950. Now, Sweat versus Painter, to be clear about this, Sweat versus Painter does not end segregation. It does not end segregation in Texas. It does not even end segregation in schools, including UT in Texas. And the reason is, is what the courts essentially argued was, is that in the case where there is no separate but equal facility, then Marion Sweat and people like him can attend University of Texas programs. So a UT, a, if, a, if a college student found a graduate program at UT that did not exist at, say, Texas Southern, or did not exist at Prairie View A&M, then they could enroll at the University of Texas. But if there was, for example, an MBA program, we'll just use that as a simple, uh, simple uh, idea. 
if there's an MBA program at Prairie View or TSU, then those African-American students must enroll at Texas Southern or at Prairie View. They cannot enroll at UT. But UT had a law school, which the others didn't at the time. So students, uh, Black students would be allowed to go there. The Sweat versus Painter case is important, though, because once the a sorcerari brief was issued, once everything wound up playing out the way it did, Thurgood Marshall looked at essentially the judicial landscape and concluded, now is the time. Now is the time where we can actually tackle desegregation directly with this court. If we find the right case, we can get the courts to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. And the case that did this was Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. Brown versus Board was actually the consolidation of 18 separate segregation cases that were pending before the Supreme Court. A lot of times that happens where an attorney or a group of attorneys will consolidate cases and allow the court to issue one ruling that affects all of these cases because the same point of law is at question. So rather than arguing 18 cases, they, or they, they argue one and then a representative ruling is issued. So that's what's going on with Brown versus Board of Education. It began in 1950 when Oliver Brown sued the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas, in order for his daughter, Linda, to attend a school that was much, much closer to their home, uh, which happened to be an all-white school. His daughter had been assigned to a separate segregated school in Topeka, Kansas, but to get there, she had to walk a half a, way, a, half a mile through a railroad switchyard, which is, for those of you who don't know what a railroad switchyard is, it's very dangerous. It's a dangerous place. Uh, and then she had to catch a municipal bus uh, while the other school, the quote, all white school, was seven blocks away. She could have been there in minutes, even walking. Now, what was important and what's different, I guess, about uh, the Brown versus Board of Education case in Topeka and why it was chosen as the lead case is instead of just arguing about segregation, instead of just arguing about separate but equal and dollars and curriculum and all that sort of stuff, what Marshall did was he chose this case because he was able to present a case that argued about developmental issues. He argued uh, on the basis of sociology, because in Topeka, Kansas, the separate but equal burden had actually been met. Those separate schools were actually equal facilities. There was no curriculum disparity. There was no disparity in terms of the teachers. The only thing that was different at these black versus white schools was the student body. So Marshall was able to present sociological documentation, sociological uh, studies and the like. And he argued that desegregation, or excuse me, segregation does harm to children on a developmental level. And the Supreme Court in March, excuse me, May of 1954 would rule unanimously to strike down segregation. And again, just listen, this is the Chief Justice Earl Warren's majority opinion. Quote, today, education is perhaps the most important function of state and local governments. Compulsory school attendance laws and the great expenditures for education both demonstrate our recognition of the importance of education to our democratic society. It is required in the performance of our most basic public responsibilities, even service in the milit in the armed forces. It is the very foundation of good citizenship. Today, it is a principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values in preparing him for later professional training and in helping him to adjust normally to his environment. In these days, it is doubtful that any child may reasonably be expected to succeed in life if he is denied the opportunity of an education. Such an opportunity where the state has undertaken to provide it is a right which must be made available to all on equal terms. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. If this sounds familiar to you, this is exactly the same philosophical reasoning 
that Marsh that John Marshall Harlan used in opposing Plessy versus Ferguson all the way back in 1896. Remember, he said separate rail cars are essentially inherently unequal because all they're saying is, is that one group of citizens is so degraded they can't sit in the same places that other citizens can. Separate is inherently unequal. That's what the courts have ruled now. Now, just like in 1896, when the court ruled to institutionalize segregation, here in the aftermath of this ruling, it has a broad effect. Sure, it effectively overturns Plessy versus Ferguson. The expectation was is that this effectively outlawed segregation everywhere. It's over virtually everywhere. However, there is a strange after effect of all of this. The court also issued in 1955, they issued a follow-up ruling that stated that, quote, desegregation must occur with all deliberate speed. Desegregation must occur with all deliberate speed. Now, that means basically as soon as possible. But I want you all who are watching this to think about in your head what as soon as possible means to each one, of, to, to yourself. Think about what it means to yourselves. I'll give you a second here. So while you're thinking that, think about how in a classroom of 35 people, for example, do you think everybody in that classroom would have the same idea of what as soon as possible actually means? Do you think if you had 2,000 cities across the country and said, you have to do this, whatever this is, as soon as possible. Do you think they'd all agree what as soon as possible actually means? And the answer, of course, is obviously no. They wouldn't agree on what it means. So by issuing this follow-up ruling, the Supreme Court actually uh, inadvertently muddied the waters on that ruling. Sorry, let's not get to Emmett Till uh, just yet. We're going to get to him here quickly enough. But the aftermath here is, is that by 1961, 99% of all African Americans still went to segregated schools. Seven years after the ruling, 99% of African American students still went to segregated schools. So obviously, as soon as possible, didn't mean seven years. Uh, the city of Houston also had their own idea of what, as, what all deliberate speed act, actually meant. They commissioned a study, and the study held that the earliest that they would be able to begin desegregation would be in 1968. And once they started, they would desegregate uh, schoolings, schooling at a rate of one grade per year. So think about that. A ruling in 1954 that says separate is inherently unequal then a ruling that says do it with all deliberate speed. And for Houston, all deliberate speed means we'll be done with this in 1980. It's no wonder that people didn't take this well. Uh, there had been a lot of victories. There had been a string of victories in the courts. And everybody was happy with those victories. Everybody loved those victories. But it became obvious to people that there was only so much you could do by chipping away at the, quote, legal foundation. There was only so much you could do through the federal judiciary. And the civil rights movement winds up going through a very distinct shift as people began taking it to the streets during this period. And the thing that kind of sparked the shift, that sparked the shift from judiciary to taking it to the streets is the Emmett Till case. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old boy. He was from Chicago, Illinois. And in August of 1955, he was visiting relatives in Money, Mississippi. While he was there, he and some friends went to a candy store and they had bought some candy. And depending on whose story you listen to and how it played out, uh, he was either dared to speak to a white woman uh, who was in the candy store or he was dared to ask her for a date or whatever. In any event, Till spoke to her and allegedly said to her, said to her, quote, bye, baby. A couple of days later, the store owner and his brother-in-law, 
took Emmett Till from the home of his uncle, and Emmett Till was never seen alive again. His body was so badly mangled that the only means of identification was a signet ring that he had been wearing that belonged to his father. The signet ring was identified by his mother. His attackers, Ron Bryant and J.W. Milam, had beaten him to a bloody mess, reportedly, repeatedly excuse me, asking him if he thought he was better than they were. And then when he replied, quote, yes, they shot him repeatedly and tied his body to a cotton gin uh, and then dumped him in the Tallahatchie River. His mother insisted that he be brought home to Chicago, and then she shocked virtually everyone by insisting that there be an open casket funeral so that all of the world can see what they did to my son, she said. Uh, and we're going to see some of these pictures. These are graphic, but again, I don't believe in sugarcoating what happened and the horrific nature of these attacks is part of is a big part of the story. This is the uh, body of Emmett Till as it's being uh, being displayed during his funeral. The pictures appeared in Jet Magazine and in newspapers all across the country. There was a Cleveland Call and Post survey that uh, suggested that in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, five out of six black preachers. Uh, were preaching sermons about the case. So this became a very nationally, nationally known and nationally charged case. As for Bryant and Milam, they were arrested for kidnapping Emmett Till even before Till's body had been found. The case was so sickening and shocking that even local newspapers in Money, Mississippi, proclaimed their outrage over the whole thing. Ultimately, while no lawyers in town would take the case, five lawyers from out of state wound up stepping forward to defend the pair. Now, the prosecution, the prosecution had some real problems at the start of the case, because in the segregated South in the 1950s, it was absolutely unheard of for African-Americans to, uh, to accuse whites of crimes and then appear in court to actually back up those accusations. However, Emmett Till's uncle, a man named Moses Wright, stepped forward and did so. He accused Bryant and Milam, said these were the men who abducted my nephew. Uh, and once Wright stepped forward, other witnesses themselves also stepped forward. This seemed to be very clearly an open and shut case. However, in the face of overwhelming evidence, in, fa in the face of those pictures that you just saw, the jury was not moved by those facts. They weren't mo moved by the bloody mangled body. They were moved by the argument of defense attorney John Witten, who said, quote, your fathers will turn over in their grave if Milam and Bryant are found guilty. And I'm sure that every last Anglo-Saxon one of you has the courage to free these men in the face of outside pressure. After deliberating for an hour, one hour, the jury acquitted Bryant and Milam with the foreman saying that the state had failed to prove that the body was that of Emmett Till. Now, I'm sure some of you have questions like, when I said earlier that Bryant and Milam attacked him, they beat him, and they asked him if he was better than they were, and he said yes. How do we know this? Were any of us there? No. But Bryant and Milam were there. And after their conviction, or excuse me, after their acquittal, knowing that they could not be charged again, Bryant and Milam actually gave an interview to Look Magazine, where they described everything that they did in detail to Emmett Till. Now, some of you may also be aware, this is a very, uh, I think this is one of these things why it's important to learn a little bit about the past so that when the past comes bubbling up again, you know how to respond and you know what's actually going on. Uh, I'm sure some of you are aware uh, that J.W. Milam's, uh, excuse me, Roy Bryant's wife, uh, his widow, 
uh, is alive and uh, living in North Carolina. And she is uh, on the verge as we, as I'm giving this lecture uh, of being served uh, with, uh, with papers uh, because of an unserved arrest warrant from the 1950s. She was very clearly and directly involved in this stuff. Uh, a very explosive book called The Bloodline uh, or The Blood of Emmett Till uh, came out a couple of years ago and Bryant's uh, wife, his widow, uh, admitted that she made up the entire story uh, about Emmett Till saying anything to her. So essentially this, this little, this young man died over literally nothing. Now, what does that have to do with galvanizing the civil rights movement? How does this transform a civil rights movement? Well, very simple. Till's mother, Mamie Till, said it best at his, at his funeral, quote, two months ago, I had a nice apartment in Chicago. I had a good job. I had a son. When something happened to the Negroes in the South, I said, that's their business, not mine. Now I know I was wrong. The murder of my son has shown me that what happens to any of us anywhere in the world had better be the business of all of us. So hearing this, this was one of those remarkable moments where everybody understood you can win all of the legal fights you want. You can get the, the Justice Department to agree to certain things. You can get the courts to create precedent after precedent after precedent. But things like the Emmett Till case are still going to happen. So something else had to be done. That's why the civil rights movement transforms from that judicial phase to a taking it to the streets sort of phase. The taking it to the streets phase is marked clearly by direct action, okay? African-Americans standing up and taking direct action in attacking forms of segregation and discrimination. Probably the most prominent is, uh, of these occurred in December of 1955, when a woman named Rosa Parks got on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, and sat down on that bus. As more and more whites got onto the bus, she was told to move. The 16 rows in the front of the bus were reserved for white riders. African Americans were allowed to sit in the middle rows of, these, uh, of the bus, uh, but if whites wanted those seats, they were required to move further and further to the back of the bus. Parks sat in the middle rows of the bus. Now, she claimed that her feet were tired. She stayed put and ultimately got arrested. Now, nice story, one that I'm sure we've all probably heard. But Rosa Parks wasn't just some tired old lady who took a stand. She wasn't even the first person who had stood up to this law. But she was the right person to be sort of the face of all of this, uh, which in no way diminishes what Rosa Parks did. I don't want anybody taking away from that, that this is this diminishes what she did. What she did was incredibly courageous, but she was the right face for this. Rosa Parks was heavily involved with her local NAACP chapter. She had been involved in voter registration drives. She had been involved in literacy uh, campaigns. And what she did that day was part of a well-organized and well-conceived plan to break the law, specifically to challenge that law. And once she got arrested, this began the so-called Montgomery bus boycott. The local community drafted a then unknown minister to lead them in the boycott, to be the public spokesman of this movement. Uh, his name was Martin Luther King Jr., 26 years old, uh, and an unknown Baptist minister at that point. But as even King would tell you, he was not the key to the Montgomery bus boycott. The key were these, or the key was these average everyday people who simply refused to get back on those buses. Boycotting the Montgomery bus system was done specifically to tell the, Montgomery, the city of Montgomery, you're not getting our business, quote unquote, the business of African Americans. And they believed that their business was crucial to the success of the municipal bus system. So as long as they didn't get on that bus, everything was going to be fine. And African Americans formed carpools, they formed walking groups, they put together uh, 
put together uh, funding uh, funding initiatives so that those who needed to get a ride somewhere could take taxis if they had to. Anything but getting on the bus. They were the ones. Their stick to itiveness all made the difference because the city of Montgomery finally caved and ordered the desegregation of the city's buses. This is significant. This is incredibly significant because for the first time since the Plessy versus Ferguson case had actually been carried out, African Americans had engaged in a protest, a direct action protest, and it ended a form of segregation. Now, the next thing that has to happen is we've, again, we've got a ruling in the Supreme Court in the Brown versus Board of Education. But there's going to need to be a direct action to get schools desegregated. And that happens in Little Rock, Arkansas. In Little Rock, Arkansas, the NAACP identified Little Rock Central High School as the next area for a direct action. Central High School in Little Rock had been built at a cost of $3 million. Now, there had been, in the days before the Brown versus Board of Education ruling, there had been a quote-unquote equal school built that cost $300,000. It was in no way equal to Central High School. But the problem here is, as many people faced in varying municipalities was, Brown versus Board may be a victory. It may have said schools have to desegregate, and then the follow-up said all deliberate speed. But he still actually had to find parents who were willing to enroll their students at these, at these traditionally white-only schools and have their kids attend. That was the next step in all of this. If a school denied them, then they were violating the law. But he still had to find people who were willing to actually put up on that front. And the NAACP managed to find 18 students. They managed to find parents for 18 students who were willing to challenge Central High School. Now, they all understood danger. Uh, they all understood the problems associated with this to the point that by the time the school year began, nine of the students, their parents had pulled them out and said, nope, we're not, we're not going through with this. Now, the notion of integration in the city of Little Rock was controversial to say the least. 85% of whites in Little Rock favored maintaining segregation, maintaining a separate but equal society. The two newspapers in Little Rock opposed this. They said, look, we have to integrate now. This is about more than just giving up old ideas like segregation. This is about the economic future of the state and the economic future of our city that, you know, we have to demonstrate that we're modern, that we're quote progressive, that we are capable of moving forward. Otherwise we're just going to get left, left behind in every single way. Didn't matter. There was going to be a concerted effort to stop the so-called little rock nine, as they were being referred to uh, from entering central high school. The governor of the state, Orville Faubus, argued that he, or said flat out, he was not going to allow these nine kids to go to school. And you can see uh, in the picture on the screen here that the children are going to be surrounded. They're not going to be, a, there, there's not going to be an easy path to the door just to even get in. The president of the United States was Dwight Eisenhower, the same Dwight Eisenhower that was the Supreme Allied commander during World War II. So he carried a little bit of cachet. And Eisenhower called Faubus and asked him personally to comply with the uh, Supreme Court's order. Faubus refused to do this. Now, when the children did try to enter Little Rock's Central High School, they were physically attacked, they were mobbed, and Eisenhower wind up, wound up sending 1,000 paratroopers along with National Guardsmen into Little Rock to make sure that these children had a clear path to the, to the entrance and that they were able to actually attend school without hassle. Now think about, again, think about how crazy this sounds. A thousand paratroopers plus National Guardsmen to allow nine kids to go to school. It's nuts, it sounds insane. Inside, there were separate bathrooms, there were separate drinking fountains in every way 
These children were still segregated. The children were harassed. They were verbally and physically assaulted by other students. They themselves understood the need to turn the other cheek because one of the Little Rock Nine had actually defended himself and wound up being uh, expelled for the remainder of the school year. As tensions escalated, Orville Faubus, the governor of Arkansas, decided that's it. He's closing all schools in Little Rock for the next year. Now, the way he ordered this, uh, this shutdown was that he ordered the suspension of all municipal services until this case, this whole issue was resolved. Students in Little Rock, Arkansas did not wind up going back to school for almost 18 months. Think about how bad that would be uh, in terms of development, in terms of intellectual development, in terms of educational development. Uh, if you're a high school senior trying to get into a decent college and all of a sudden, forget, forget our pandemic and how ridiculous, uh, ridiculously things went here uh, in terms of trying to cobble together distance education. Think about just being told, forget it, there's no school for 18 months. Think about how far behind those students actually would actually be. So this was very difficult. Now, the question becomes, after all of this fight for integration, we're now in 1957. Think about that. We're in, in 1957 at this point. So what does it mean by 1960 to actually be white in this country? A, uh, a historian, uh, a social historian, uh, wrote a book called The Wages of Whiteness in, uh, in, the in the early 2000s. And he compared the early 2000s to the 1960s. Uh, and he determined that what the wages of whiteness meant, what it means to be white in the United States. In 1960, it meant an additional eight years of life expectancy. And this is across all economic standards and all of that sort of stuff. So, you know, this is accounting for there being a black middle class and there being some African-Americans who ascended to even greater heights on the social ladder. But it meant in general an eight year bump in life expectancy. Whites were far more likely to go to school, including college and graduate school. Unemployment rates decreased by 50%, while personal income increased by one third and family income went up to, by 50%. Now, what's remarkable about this quote unquote wages of whiteness and why this historian wrote this book is that in comparing it to similar data in 2002, he found that literally nothing had changed in 2002 to be white in the United States meant an additional eight years in life expectancy, a much higher rate of college attendance and graduate school attendance, a decrease in unemployment by 50%, personal income increased by one third, while family income increased by 50%. So clearly there's a disparity in this country. Clearly, whether you've got no legal victories, whether you've got a bunch of legal victories, whether you've got people demanding change, there was still a problem in this country. Fewer than 25% of all African Americans voted at the outset of the 1960s. They were still routinely shut out from white owned restaurants and hotels with virtually no redress for that. But African-Americans were still suffering outside of the South as well. Uh, in most Northern cities, African-Americans were kept out of various neighborhoods. Uh, they were kept out of businesses and labor unions. Uh, there had been cases that had, uh, it, before the Supreme Court that had removed restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants were illegal now, but they became simply informal arrangements amongst uh, neighborhood associations. Uh, banks engaged in redlining during this period, barring African-Americans from areas by simply saying, we're gonna draw a literally a red line around a certain part of the map. And people who live within that part of the map do not, we're not gonna give them loans. We're not gonna give them small business loans. We're not gonna give them uh, mortgages, nothing. 
So these people are going to basically be stuck in this area. Uh, on top of that, labor unions refuse to organize African-American workers. So what's going on here, if you remember all the way back to when I talked about Plessy versus Ferguson, I talked about there being a pendulum swing from de jure, or excuse me, de facto segregation, segregation by custom, to de jure segregation, segregation by law. Well, now we're seeing the thing swing back after Brown versus Board of Education. De jure segregation is out. It, it's not enforceable anymore. From a legal standpoint, it's not enforceable. But de facto segregation remained as strong as ever in the United States. Now, the next quote you're going to hear is from Martin Luther King Jr. himself, who looked at this and was, was I'm not going to say despondent, but he was not exactly, uh, he was not exactly uh, positive about the future of race relations in the United States. When he said this, he said, quote, uh, if you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, stay back. African-Americans began a whole new activist phase during this period in the aftermath of these realizations heading into the 1960s. This new activism phase focused around groups that would create the activism, that they would recruit people to engage in the activism, They'd recruit people to support that activism, whether it was through directly going out and marching, whether it was raising funds, whether it was coming up with the philosophical underpinnings of it, whatever. It's going to be organized activity. So groups like the Congress of Racial Equality or CORE uh, emerged. CORE was a multiracial civil rights organization. Uh, a group called the Southern Christian Leadership Council emerged. Uh, and both of these groups, CORE and the Southern Christian Leadership Council, uh, preached the idea of nonviolent civil disobedience. Uh, there was another group called SNCC during this period, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And as these groups are getting together, what they're doing is they're preaching this idea of nonviolent reaction to discrimination and to civil rights, essentially turning the other cheek. The argument went, that when you respond to violence with violence, you lose the moral high ground. So you don't respond in kind. You turn the other cheek. Now, arguably, their greatest success, their most popular, their most uh, their most popular success, uh, the one that got the most uh, visibility, was the integration of lunch counters uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, four African-American students in 1961 arrived at a Woolworth counter and attempted to order coffee. Woolworth counters, uh, Woolworth lunch counters were segregated. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Woolworths was, uh, it was kind of a, a 1950s slash 60s version uh, of Walmart. It was a general store. It had a, and it also had uh, prominently had lunch counters and restaurants in virtually all of their stores as well. So these kids show up at nine o'clock in the morning, and they left at five when the store closed, receiving no service. They were completely ignored. The next day, they arrived with a couple of more friends. The following day, there were 25 students sitting at that lunch counter attempting to be served coffee. Now, they weren't served coffee, and in fact, they were attacked. They were beaten. They had cigarettes stubbed out on their bodies. They had coffee from the other patrons dumped on them, so they wound up being in attacked and, and very vulnerable as all of this stuff is happening. And that's where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, actually saw its first action. SNCC, as it was called, uh, led by a man named Marion Barry, uh, followed very quickly by providing support for these students at this sit-in, providing relief for them, meaning that if students had to go to class or something, somebody else would come in and take their place. If people needed medical attention, that person would be taken out to get the medical attention and another person could come in uh, and take their place. They raised funds uh, for medical attention, all of this sort of stuff in a support role for all of this sit-in uh, activity. And it worked. By the time uh, 1962 uh, rolled around, uh, San Antonio, Texas uh, became the first city in the country to fully desegregate uh, and by August of 1961, lunch counters in 18 states were ordered to be desegregated. So the sit-in movement was actually working. 
It was working and it was working very well. But just like during the 19 teens and the 1920s, when we talked about different philosophies, then there's a different philosophy that's emerging here as well. And it's very much tied to that. There's a reason I'm connecting it to the 1920s. There were other ideas behind nonviolence. There were other ideas, just like in the 1920s, there were different ideas behind besides accommodation and confrontation. What's happening in the 1960s is a black power movement. Uh, and it's, it's also frequently referred to as black nationalism. There's a very strong connection between black nationalism and black power and the separatist movement that we talked about in the 1920s. Groups like the Black Panthers, the Nation of Islam, and many others called themselves Black Power movements because they in general believed, like Marcus Garvey did, that the white establishment in the United States was never going to acknowledge the true equality of African Americans. So it was going to be up to African Americans to be self-sufficient, to be independent of white America, to take care of themselves, essentially. Now, the most widely held vision of these black power groups is men with automatic weapons allegedly pre preaching hate. But what they were advocating for with all of this stuff was not violence for violence's sake. For example, uh, Malcolm X, Huey Newton, uh, and Robert Williams, uh, the three men that I have on the screen here, uh, argued that simply waiting for whites to protect them was, it was silly. It didn't make sense. If you have all of these whites who are carrying out violence and it's whites who control the police forces. If you've got police forces that have a ton of interconnectivity with the Ku Klux Klan, they're not coming to help you. They're not going to come and save you. It's up to you to protect yourself. Robert Williams had lived in North Carolina his entire life. Uh, and he led a far more radical NAACP branch than virtually any other branch in the United States. And he, uh, he argued in print that it was uh, simply irresponsible for African-Americans in his part of North Carolina uh, to not own guns for self-protection because they were under constant attack by the Ku Klux Klan. And as was dem demonstrated over and over again, uh, in North Carolina, the same people that made up the Ku Klux Klan made up the local law enforcement. So it was not going to be the law enforcement that was going to come out and protect people. Now, incidentally, while people like this are attacked as having these radical views that are so, quote unquote, out there and have no uh, seemingly have no equal within society, Ida B. Wells argued the same thing in the face of lynchings, that it was it was far more it was far better to actually own a weapon for self-protection than to simply rely on local law enforcement to come uh, and protect African-Americans uh, from lynching. It's worth pointing out here as well, the Black Panthers, for example, uh, also had a 10-point plan uh, out, of, in, out of Oakland, California, that called for things like uh, parity in school funding, uh, that called for uh, the extension of health care all across the country uh, to all people, regardless of race, color, or class. They called for an expansion of school lunch programs, an expansion of library services, and all sorts of other things that had nothing to do with literally, quote, Black power. So in a lot of ways, many historians refer to this Black power movement as more of a Black empowerment idea, uh, as opposed to simply, quote, Black power uh, and violence for violence's sake. The idea of people preaching violence for violence's sake does not actually hold a ton of merit here. Now, informing a lot of this black nationalism of the 1960s were ideas that had their roots in the 1920s and 1930s. There was obviously Marcus Garvey's Pan-Africanism from that same era. Uh, there was obviously the experience of World War II, uh, the anti-racist rhetoric, but also uh, there was a notion coming out of World War II that the Irish, that Irish people, that Italians, that Germans, all of these other groups had things that were uh, that could have been done. There could have been all sorts of violence carried on against them, but it wasn't done because their nations, those countries, would stand up for their emigres. So if there was an attack on Italian people. 
in the United States, then Italy would stand up for these people. Uh, so the idea that we could that people could go to the United Nations, that people could stand up for uh, for em for immigrant populations. This was informing a lot of people in the Black Power movement. This helped push an idea called the Non-Aligned Movement in the United uh, across uh, the world, and the Non-Aligned Movement was very specifically supported by African Americans. African Americans watched as nation after nation across Africa fought back against colonialism, uh, fought back against the idea of empires. And this all kind of coincides with the Cold War, okay? In the Cold War, Americans and American policymakers were telling all of these countries that you need to either be like us or we're going to consider you to be an enemy. We're going to, be, we're going to consider you to be like the Soviet Union. Well, it's one thing to say that. But countries like the Republic of Congo, Kenya, Mozambique, all of these countries liberated themselves, but then looked at the United States and said, okay, before we make a decision about whether we're going to align ourselves with you, we want to make sure that you deal with people who look like us on an equal basis. And if not, we may, it doesn't mean that we're going to the Soviet Union. We may reject the Soviet Union too. We'll just take our own course. And that's what the non-aligned movement was all about. It was saying that from a geopolitical standpoint, people of African descent were going to stand on their own and not rely on anybody. They were going to be essentially self-reliant. So this whole non-aligned movement fed into the idea of black nationalism in the United States as well. So by 1961, there's a lot of things going on in terms of the civil rights movement. There's a nonviolent civil disobedience camp. There's a black nationalist camp. And there were nations that were watching what the United States was doing. Uh, and with this came a lot of optimism about what the 1960s might actually be. In the early parts of the 1960s, there were a record number of people who claimed that they were quote unquote liberal. They believed that economic growth, this unprecedented economic growth that the United States was having was going to make everyone equal. It would eliminate inequality. So there's a lot of optimism. Between 1961 and 1964, there was battle after battle fought to overcome or to attempt to overcome racial discrimination. And while there are all these attempts, there's also a blowback to all of this stuff as well. 1961 saw the Freedom Rider movement emerge here. Many bus and rail systems and stations across the country were segregated, and a group of college students from the Congress of Racial Equality decided they were going to forcibly desegregate these buses. They started taking buses southward in an attempt to stop all of this stuff. In one of the more infamous cases of this, a busload of college students primarily uh, took a bus from Michigan to Birmingham, Alabama. As they got closer to Birmingham, Alabama, they were forced off of their bus and were forced to watch as the bus was torched. Uh, undeterred, they got another bus. And when violence threatened to break out again, now President John F. Kennedy ordered federal marshals into Birmingham to enforce laws. And eventually, Kennedy decreed that the Interstate Commerce Commission must declare segregation of buses traveling state lines to be illegal. So he took part of Truman's 10-point plan and finally implemented it in 1961. By 1961, we're starting to see the desegregation of more colleges occurring at this point. Uh, the key, one of the key places was the University of Mississippi in 1961, and the case of a nine-year veteran named James Meredith, uh, pictured on the right side of the screen here. Meredith had been an Air Force veteran, had actually applied to and been rejected by the University of Mississippi. Uh, he filed a lawsuit, uh, which he won in 1962. Uh, however, because of his victory in that lawsuit, the governor of Mississippi, a guy named Ross Barnett, vowed he was not going to allow James Meredith to attend the University of Mississippi. And he literally declared himself to be the registrar. Now, registrars don't actually 
personally do this anymore. Uh, but the last person that you would see after you registered for classes back in the old days, the last person you'd see was the registrar. You would hand them the, the schedule that you'd chosen. They would take the schedule. They'd punch it into a series of punch cards, run it through a computer that would generate your fee bill and all of that stuff. And as soon as you paid the fee bill, you were, you were done. By naming himself the, for the registrar of the University of Mississippi, Ross Barnett would be in a position so that when James Meredith showed up to hand over his, his schedule, Barnett would be in a position to rip it in half and say, you don't get to go to the Un University of Mississippi. Uh, now, President Kennedy sends 16,000 federal troops to, again, company one person to the University of Mississippi. That's how dangerous these things were getting. That's how bad this was, that there were 16,000 troops needed to quell the allowing of one person to go to the University of Mississippi. Uh, the next place where we'd see this problem, uh, this blowback effect, uh, was in the city of Birmingham, Alabama. In 1963, the new governor of Alabama, a guy named George Wallace, he's pictured on the bottom right of the screen, stood in front of the doors of the University of Alabama after you know, basically seeing the tide of what was going on with desegregation. And, uh, and Wallace said as quotes, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He said, we are not giving in in Alabama to any sort of order to desegregate this place. Uh, he said he'd give that same speech virtually everywhere if he had to, and he would personally bar the doors. Uh, ultimately, what wound up happening in Birmingham was very similar to what happened in Little Rock. Birmingham shut down all of the schools and all city facilities in order to stop black children from going to schools and allowing African Americans to go to public colleges. In response to this shutdown, Martin Luther King Jr. and his congregations marched through the streets of Birmingham every single day, dressed in their Sunday best, as a way to fight this discrimination. Again, these are nonviolent civil disobedience marches. Uh, the police would show up, and eventually the police actually arrested King and his supporters for marching through the city streets, public streets, mind you, without a permit. Once these people got arrested, their children stepped in and started marching through the streets. Their children got dressed in their own Sunday best and started marching through the streets, demanding an end to discrimination. Uh, and this time, the police chief of Birmingham, a guy named uh, Bull Connor, uh, responded uh, in one of the more ugly ways during this period. Uh, Connor unleashed, unleashed police dogs to attack the marchers and turned fire hoses uh, that had 700 plus pounds of pressure per square inch on these kids who were marching. Uh, victory came from an unlikely source in all of this stuff, the televised national news. All of this was being broadcast across the country, over the air, across the country, because of the changes in technology that had occurred since the 1950s. Now, national broadcasts for news had expanded to a half an hour, they used satellite-based cameras uh, so that they could take handheld cameras out to a to a place, and the they would film things that would be that would be beamed to a satellite, and then from the satellite to a studio. So they didn't really have to worry about having to process tape and all of that stuff and getting it uh, to a studio. So all of this is being played out in front of the American public, and. There were people in the United States, there were obviously people who opposed segregation. There were obviously people who opposed desegregation or opposed discrimination, but there were also people who supported segregation and discrimination, but who seeing all of this play out said, well, I support segregation, but I don't support that. Okay. So this wound up having a transformative effect uh, on uh, 
on cities like Birmingham. They stopped doing this because they realized where our, our ignorance is on full display for the entire country, and we look terrible as a result of this. Now, those are that's a somewhat minor victory of sorts. There is a victory in all of that, but there is a cost to all of this stuff because uh, white extremists now uh, move into act activities. Uh, they firebombed the house of Martin Luther King Jr.'s brother. They blew up a number of uh, hotels uh, that catered to African American uh, travelers. The Ku Klux Klan uh, wound up murdering the head of the NAACP in Mississippi, a guy named Medgar Evers. They then uh, engaged in a bombing in a church in Birmingham, Alabama, that killed four little girls, a very, fa a very infamous bombing. Of a, Bir of a Birmingham church. Over the course of the next several weeks, 35 homes were firebombed, 20,000 people were arrested for protest, and dozens of people were killed. The time was now for the country to go on record. Civil rights leaders decided they were going to engage in a march on Washington, D.C. They were going to demand that the country do something about civil rights, that they pass some form of legislation to really, truly integrate this country. Now, President Kennedy was unable to deny the force of 250,000 people who showed up at Washington, D.C. to demand these civil rights in March of 1963. And at this civil rights march, I'm sure you've all heard of the famous I Have a Dream speech, uh, which is uh, being portrayed in the image on the left of your screen. But I want to read you a part of it, of that speech that is not typically, uh, typically spoken uh, during all of these celebrations for Martin Luther King Day and even commemorating the Civil Rights Act. Uh, you know, and I dare say it doesn't really fit well on uh, a McDonald's place map or anything like that, uh, place mat or anything like that. King said, in addition to the famous, I have a dream statement, he said, quote, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by a sign stating, for whites only. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. In verbalizing this, King was saying there's something bigger about this civil rights movement. It's not just about ending discrimination. It's not just about codifying equal rights. There is something about equality of opportunity that is missing in the United States as well. Now, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is a big step in the right direction. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 comes directly out of this, uh, of this direct action. It banned discrimination in all public facilities, such as restaurants and hotels. It also banned discrimination in employment and it set up the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the United States as a way, as a sort of watchdog agency to make sure that these, you know, the banning and discrimination, for example, in employment, that that gets carried out, that there aren't people who are rejected for jobs simply because they're black. The biggest problem, though, is what's not addressed in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There's still a big problem. Remember, King said in that last part that, you know, part of the problem is, is that people in Mississippi can't vote and people in New York, Negroes in New York, feel they have nothing to vote for. So voting is still a big problem here. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964, as important as it is, does not address the fundamental issue of voting rights. So 
as soon as this is all done, as soon as this is finished, uh, King and his supporters began the next phase in trying to fix, to right the wrongs, if you will. Literacy tests and poll, ta poll taxes were still in effect in the United States, just like they were in the very first classes that, uh, that, that I lectured on. Uh, the questions that the examiners asked were not particularly easy, uh, especially for those who lacked a basic education. So to target these problems, African-Americans continued to march uh, and tried to register to vote. In Selma, Alabama, registers, registrars there refused to even talk to people who showed African-Americans who showed up simply asking to register to vote. So the marchers stayed and they got arrested. And this continued for several weeks as Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, led marchers to Montgomery, Alabama. This is the infamous, I shouldn't say the infamous, this is the famous Selma to Montgomery march that ended uh, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge as these people were about to cross into Montgomery, Alabama. Now, the reason I call it infamous and then said famous is because as the marchers got to this bridge where their plan is to go to the Capitol and demand that people be given the right to register to vote, the Alabama State Police met these marchers and once again, with television cameras rolling in full view of people in the United States, the Alabama State Police attacked these marchers. Americans were shocked as young people, as all sorts of civilians were beaten, attacked by dogs, mauled in every way, tortured, and again, federal troops wound up having to be sent in to protect these marchers from being killed essentially by state police forces. Uh, difference is this time it's Lyndon Johnson that's doing it. As soon as this march was over, the Ku Klux Klan once again struck back on all of this stuff. First, uh, involving themselves in the killing of some of the marchers. Uh, two young men from uh, went to Miss, uh, Mississippi uh, to try to uh, register African Americans to vote. These were uh, they were named Michael Schwermer and Andrew Goodman. Uh, as all of this was going on, the uh, Ku Klux Klan also uh, killed a woman named Violetta Liuzzo, uh, whose uh, whose crime, if you will, was that she had been giving African Americans rides back to and from uh, registration centers. Uh, so when all of this is happening. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, the president of the United States, actually went on television uh, and delivered a speech, and you can watch it on YouTube, it's, it's, it's on YouTube, uh, where he called the Ku Klux Klan the enemies of justice. He talked about how they claimed that they were enforcing old-time values, that they were essentially vigilante justice and all of this, and Johnson said, no, these are people who are the enemies of justice. And he got Congress to push to push through some major reforms. The first was the 24th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The 24th Amendment to the United States Constitution outlawed the poll tax. It was ratified and got added to the United States Constitution. So that poll tax that we talked about in the very first classes uh, this semester, it is now illegal. It's not only illegal, it's unconstitutional. The second thing that gets passed is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act of 1965. Now, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 prohibited literacy tests. It said that federal officials would register Black votes uh, in the South uh, in places where uh, registrars were failing to per perform their duties. If that happens, federal, aid, federal officials will come in and do the job for them. And then it also made it a federal offense to attempt to dilute the African-American vote. This was uh, aimed at attempting to uh, prohibit gerrymandering. Now, a couple of, uh, I wanna mention one thing before we move on to our next topic. The, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was put into place, but it was not a permanent enactment, if you will. It was certified for 40 years as a way of making sure that all of this stuff gets done, that this stuff gets implemented. In 2005, it came before the United States Congress for recertification. And there was a very bitter fight 
over recertification. And ultimately, Congress only agreed to recertify it for an additional 10 years. In 2015, the bulk of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was struck down by the United States Supreme Court on the basis that it's not 1965 anymore. We're all equal. We've all proven that we're equal. There's nobody who would ever violate these types of laws anymore. I'm just going to leave that without commentary. Now, something strange happened after the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Five days after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, a riot erupted in Watts, Watts, California. It's an area today that's better known as South Central Los Angeles. And this riot in Watts lasted for days. Suddenly, white Americans realized that racial problems in this country were not just a black problem and that they weren't just a quote unquote Southern problem. Southern whites were shocked to find out that there were currents in black America who were hostile to whites, not just the Nation of Islam and their most well-known minister, Malcolm X, not just radical wings of the NAACP, but other groups and other racial minorities were hostile to whites. The goal, ending legal segregation, turned out to not be enough. African Americans and an emerging brown power movement in Watts began pushing for true equality of opportunity. What people in Watts were pointing out was that there was nothing available for people in Watts, that there were no jobs, that there was no ability to qualify for home loans to escape the ghetto or to escape the barrio. There's nothing there for these people. So we're going to be heard, they said. And this Watts riot developed in 1965, developed into a much broader fight. There were riots all across the country in the middle to tail end of the 1960s in Newark, in Newark, New Jersey, in Boston, over the in Cleveland, Ohio, over the same sorts of things in Houston, Texas, right around where uh, Texas Southern University is. There were all of these same types of riots over the same issue equality of opportunity. And what we saw in all of these circumstances was it wasn't just African Americans. It was this emerging brown power movement that was a big part of this. Now, the brown power movement also had roots that predated the 1960s. Uh, after the war with Mexico in 1848, people of Mexican descent living in Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, California, Arizona, these people became citizens of the United States for the, uh, the overwhelming majority of these people became citizens. There were a number who also, quote, repatriated to Mexico, meaning they moved south of the border to the present borders of Mexico. But the overwhelming majority stayed in these regions and became citizens of the United States. But because of laws that were enacted that required these residents to prove ownership uh, of land, the majority of these now American citizens wound up becoming a landless migratory labor class in the United States. This persisted right up through World War II, punctuated by periods where labor was desperately needed, and thus the borders were kind of swung open in a manner of speaking. Uh, and then other periods like the Great Depression era, where there were mass deportations. Uh, during, uh, during the Great Depression, uh, there were more than 500,000 people of Mexican descent who were deported uh, to Mexico, uh, half of whom were actually American citizens who somehow got deported. Their crime was simply being brown. By the 1960s, Mexican Americans faced a lot of the same issues as other minorities. And I know I'm focusing on Mexican Americans here, but this brown power movement, it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. This brown power movement emerged into a much broader uh, Latino movement, or, or what we today even refer to as Latinx movement. Uh, so it starts out within Mexican American and Chicano communities and becomes a much broader uh, Latino, uh, pro Latino movement. Uh, 
Uh, now, the problems that the Mexican-American community was facing in the United States, uh, again, very similar to what African-Americans had faced when we talked about them demographically in the 1890s, geographically isolated overwhelmingly. The Mexican-American population lived in the Americans, what we call the American Southwest. The median income was about 62% of that of the Anglo population, or excuse me, of the general population. Over one third of Mexican American families subsisted on less than $3,000 per year. That's in 1960, less than $3,000 per year. The unemployment rate was twice that of non Latinos. And again, there's a concentrate, a very heavy concentration in one industry. 80% of the Latin, of the Mexican American population, excuse me, uh, was employed in semi skilled or unskilled labor with one third of those being employed in agricultural pursuits. So things did not look great in the night, heading into the 1960s, but there were going to be some very important victories in 1963, for example, in Crystal City, Texas, something happened in those municipal elections that had never happened before. The city had always had a majority Mexican American population to a two to one count actually, and yet, there had never been a Mexican-American public official. But in 1963, courtesy of efforts of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, uh, they began registering Mexican-American voters to, uh, to vote. They began uh, educational, uh, educational efforts, uh, educating people on the issues of, of Crystal City. They began engaging in literacy campaigns and in 1963, Mexican Americans won control of Crystal City. They wound up sweeping to a victory in all of the elective offices. There were other changes as well. In 1962, Cesar Chavez began organizing California farm workers in an attempt to force higher wages to get the state of California to actually enforce labor laws. Uh, and Cesar Chavez was very clear on a lot of this stuff that while it was considered to be part of the civil rights movement, that it was part of a quote unquote brown power movement. Chavez always argued that what he was talking about was very clearly human rights issues. Think about some of the things that he's gonna argue for uh, as the head of these workers in California. California labor laws required access to bathroom, bathroom breaks and Latino workers on various farms up and down uh, the length of California were frequently refused access to bathrooms. These people could be working 12 to 16 hour days, picking grapes, picking lettuce, picking tomatoes, all sorts of things that wound up going on to the tables of American citizens. And they're being told, no, you're not allowed to take two minutes to go to the bathroom. So Chavez looked at this as very clearly, it's not a Latino issue, he said, it's a human rights issue. So. Chavez, probably better than anybody else in the actual field, merged these ideas of civil rights, uh, minority rights, with the idea of human rights. Uh, people like Reyes Lopez Tijerina also uh, moved to try to address a fundamental problem within the community dating back to the 1848 war. In 1963, Tijerina established something called the Alianza Federal de Mercedes or the Federal Alliance uh, of Land. This was done in, in an attempt to try to restore ownership of Mexican American lands to them, to find the actual titles, to make sure that the titles were squared away and that land was actually returned to their proper owners. So uh, heirs would actually get land back uh, from, you know, from people who had swindled them uh, in the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. Mexican Americans also uh, had to fight for equal access to education. In 1968, Mexican Americans lobbied for and won from Congress legislation that occurred, that encouraged, let me try that again, encouraged bilingual education and to instruct non English speaking students in both their native language and in English, rather than simply immersing people and throwing them into the deep end uh, from a language standpoint. Driving a lot of this change was not just groups like the League of, U uh, of United Latin American Citizens, which is kind of loosely uh, 
uh, a Latino version of the NAACP. But you had a lot of student groups and young people who were driving uh, this process as well. Groups like La Raza Unida and groups that began on the campus of UCLA, like uh, the United Mexican American Students and Congress of Mexican American Unity. These groups began on college campuses initially about fighting fee and tuition increases, but evolved by the late 1960s uh, to fight to maintain cultural integrity, to encourage Mexican Americans to be proud of their heritage, especially uh, in the Congress of, uh, of Mexican American Unity. They fought to ensure that Mexican Americans were registered to vote and educated on the issues of the day so that they could cast ballots uh, in a meaningful way. Now, another group that emerges during this period uh, and became militant in the process is Native Americans. Their ascent began in the 1950s when the Tuscarora Indians filed a lawsuit in New York to resist attempts uh, by the state of New York to convert their reservation lands into a reservoir. Uh, the state of New York was simply going to take the land without approval, uh, and the Tuscarora filed a lawsuit and stopped all of this. This victory in this lawsuit gave rise to, again, something called the Red Power Movement that by 1961 was led primarily by youth. Uh, there were groups like, uh, uh, like the Native American Rights Fund, for example, uh, that, uh, that filed lawsuits uh, so once again, we have a sort of roughly uh, rough parallel to the NAACP. Uh, but groups like the National Indian Youth Council uh, took a page from CORE and SNCC uh, and started holding fish-ins uh, and wade-ins to protest various state efforts to stop Indians from fishing. Even those were these were things that had been guaranteed by treaty rights over and over again. Uh, the Native American Rights Fund, uh, excuse me, the in Indian Historical Association uh, or Indian Historical Society uh, arose to try to, to try to teach a more Indian-based version of history rather than have this story out uh, that it was whites who were the glorious heroes of all of these encounters and that they were besieged by Native Americans over and over again. The Indian Historical Society pointed out that, no, you know, Indians were the ones who were on their homelands and were constantly under attack uh, by an encroaching United States. So their plan, that, and, and it worked, was to try to create a more balanced narrative uh, about history for, the United, for Native Americans. Probably the most well-known group uh, in the Red Power Movement was something called the AIM, the American Indian Movement, uh, which arose in 1966 in Minnesota, originally to protest police brutality against Native Americans. They eventually became a national group that led their own march on Washington, D.C. This time they referred to it as the, quote, Trail of Broken Treaties. Uh, and when they got to Washington, D.C., they seized the offices of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Department of the Interior. In the mid-1970s, uh, they not only uh, had engaged in this stuff, but they also uh, occupied Alcatraz Island in San Francisco, and a group of 300 of them actually took, oh, 300 leaders in the AIM, took over Wounded Knee, South Dakota, and occupied that town for 71 days to bring attention to the plight of Native Americans at places like the Pine Ridge Agency. Once again, the militancy of these groups paid off. By the mid-1970s, federal legislation had given Native American parents full control over their children's education. So things like the Carlisle School, we talked about again earlier in this semester, things like the Carlisle School, the, the government couldn't force parents to send their children to the Carlisle School. That was something that was a parental decision and a parental decision only. In 1968, the Supreme Court ruled that states could not invalidate hunting and fishing rights. Uh, this was a case for what it's worth. Uh, it was called Menominee Tribes versus the United States. Uh, but the more important takeaway from this is that the United States said you can't invalidate these hunting and fishing rights. Congress also enacted legislation to improve health care, to, to give indigenous peoples uh, greater say in custody cases. The biggest uh, fight was a lawsuit that was filed in 1976 
over the Black Hills in South Dakota, uh, a, uh, a, an agreement of sorts was reached in 1980 where the United States government agreed to pay into a fund uh, to pay back uh, the various Native American groups for the Black Hills. Uh, it's estimated that that fund currently has over $100 million in it. However, the settlement was not made public because Native Americans refused to accept the settlement because the settlement re uh, required that Native Americans continue, uh, that they once and for all relinquish control of the Black Hills. So the thing that we talked about that started the Indian Wars in the West is still an ongoing thing in the United States uh, that uh, the United States government kind of looks at it as settled, uh, but Native Americans uh, don't see it that way. Now, this is obviously uh, a sort of rushed version uh, of civil rights in the Brown Power Movement and the Red Power Movement. Uh, this, again, does not even begin to discuss stuff uh, like the rising feminism of the 1960s or the rise of gay rights in the 1960s uh, and uh, the various fights that people are still having uh, to this day uh, in the area of transgender rights. And, uh, and I think it's important to kind of look at all of these things and note that just like with African-Americans, just like with red power, just like with brown power, the overarching theme of these, it's about equality. It's about the equality of being a citizen in the United States. All citizens have the right to equal access to the law but also equality of opportunity. This is why guys like Cesar Chavez, this is why people like Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the equality of opportunity within uh, their fights for civil rights. So none of this stuff is actually completed, even though uh, we're gonna finish it from a lecture standpoint here. This doesn't mean that this fight is actually over. The fight is still ongoing. All right, in the next class, uh, we'll talk about uh, probably the trauma of the 1960s, uh, that being the Vietnam War. So we'll see you next time.